and welcome back to Pass the Torque. I'm your host, Katie Kadri, and this is your co-host, Gus. We're here this week with Doris Jallis. She is here to answer your questions. Don't forget, we have informational bubbles pop up to let you know what's going on. Without further ado, I'll pass it to Doris. Can you explain what you do? Working in the chemical analysis lab, you work for or support all flight projects at Goddard because all flight projects have to verify that they're clean and and all flight projects may have some kind of contamination prob problem that they want us to look at. Contamination can be a problem because they can cause failures on surfaces if they're not clean in the sense that a smudge on a mirror may cause the mirror to lose part of its field of view and a smudge and oils from your fingertips can keep stuff from bonding. Um, I like to say what I do is sort of material investigation because when I look for material issues, when I look to solve material issues and problems, um, the contamination that's involved could be all sorts of things and come from all kinds of different um, places. And so basically I have to determine what it is, where it came from, and how to get rid of it. So I like to say it's like I'm doing material science investigation, like CSI. What's the strangest contaminant source you've ever found? I don't know if it's the strangest, but I was on a Tiger Team investigation and we were looking into contamination in the clean room facility here at Goddard. And I used the mass spec actually. It identifies uh, chemical compounds, I'm going to say, by looking at a fingerprint, which is a spectrum. And each spectrum ha it has a unique fingerprint that identifies what chemical compound that we've um, found. I determined that the contamination was from an additive that they used in the water ply system to heat the building. And then the next thing after you determine what it is, you have to say um, how to get rid of it. So we developed a cleaning process to clean the entire clean room and any hardware that was in it. You just solvent clean it, um, wipe it down. And then you also take a rinse of a surface and that's where I would come in again to verify that that particular contaminant is no longer present. How many different satellites or instruments have you saved over the years? Okay, that's a very good question, and I, I think I've never looked at it that way, but actually I do save uh, missions because I keep um, instruments from failing due to contamination. So I verify that instruments are clean and therefore there won't be any sources of contamination that can cause failures because like an eyelash or a particle or something oily or slimy can cause different components and to not function properly or work. Did you come straight to NASA when you graduated? Well, actually I did. So I was fortunate and lucky enough to have NASA be my first job. And so I sometimes like to say luck is when is what happens when preparation meets opportunity because you you don't know what's what you'll what opportunities will come and what you'll face so it's best that you study hard and work hard in school and you may be fortunate enough to get a very good opportunity because you're prepared what other work does the materials branch do Besides all the testing that is done in labs, we do have a group of engineers that support the projects directly doing materials um, support, and they're called materials and process engineers. So they support the project 
on any materials issues and they provide advice and they recommend testing and they can bring work back in, in the lab for us to perform investigations and do fail, failure analysis and maybe non-destructive evaluations to solve any issues or problems that, there, that occur, are occurring. When you were a child, did you know you wanted to be an engineer? Can you share a moment when you realized this is what you wanted to do? Okay. When I was a child, I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to be. It would change like one day I want to be a teacher or a doctor, but it was mostly things I was familiar with. So I never heard of an engineer and I didn't know what engineering was about. And the only way that I got into engineering was I got a pamphlet after uh, completing my college entrance exams. And they said, due to your um, performance in math and science, that you might want to consider being an engineer. And they said, oh, an engineer is not just a person that drives a train, because that's most people back then, that's all they knew uh, about engineers were people that drove trains. So um, that's how I got my introduction into engineering. So exposure is very important. So that's why I think this series is, is very important because you never know, maybe listening to one of the engineers on this show um, or series might spark your interest to um, be an engineer. How are satellites tested before going into orbit? That's a very good question. All satellites are tested before they go into orbit and they go through a series of tests called space simulation tests. And they're, they are actually done in our integration and test facility at, here at Goddard. So when the satellite is being launched, it will experience a lot of vibration and noise. And so we simulate that kind of testing on the satellite. So we have vibration tests that the satellite will go through where it's shaken and we make sure nothing falls off and nothing is broken or damaged from being um, from vibration and then to to experience the loud noise that it will experience they also have acoustic testing when and they're put in a room and there's loud um, noise that happens and we also check to see if the satellite will be okay after that and they also do thermal vacuum testing. So thermal vacuum testing is to simulate the vacuum and temperatures that the mission will see in space so that you also know that the temperatures, cold temperatures, will not stop the performance of the instrument or equipment or satellite. Which materials fare better or worse in space and how do we find that out? How do you build things to withstand the harshest of conditions? Different materials do work better in space, and that's why we test. We do know that some materials, we do, I do have an example of one material that works in space well, and it's Kevlar, and Kevlar is very strong, and it's what um, policemen and military use for their bulletproof vests. So that's an example of very strong material that is used. Um, some materials we don't like to use in space because they um, outgas, and that can also cause problems. And the vapors that they give off, they can contaminate a nearby piece of equipment or electronics. And if they will deposit after the vapors are given off, they'll deposit or settle on something and make it not operate properly. Outgassing is like vapors being emitted. Like if you're inside of a car, a brand new car, you know they say a brand new car has a car smell, right? So that's because there's the materials that are 
in the car, they're giving or emitting off these smells or vapors like we call them. So that's why um, you have to have to be careful about things that are strong outgassers because eventually they could condense like on your on your windshield the pl if the plasticizer that's what some of the materials are called plasticizer they're just from plastics they might deposit and make a film or a fog and then when they settle on top of a piece of electronics or a mirror then that is considered contamination again because it can stop a, like an electronics uh, component from operating or functioning properly what techniques are employed by NASA to identify biological contaminants and keep them from ending up in space? We do have a biological um, lab in our building, but it's not in our branch. And it's called the Planetary Protection Lab. And in that lab, she studied, the engineer studies uh, contamination, biological contamination in that lab. And how to prevent it, and how to detect it. What techniques are employed by the researchers and engineers to keep the labs clean and functional? Researchers will, that work in labs, they will keep the lab clean by uh, wearing gloves and lab coats and wiping down surfaces. That's mainly how they would keep the lab clean. Now, if they were working in a lab that was actually in a clean area or a clean room, then they might suit up in a, what we like to call a bunny suit, which protects the it not it protects the room and the equipment that you're working on from you. So your hair and your oils in your finger and can um, actually contaminate the surfaces of the hardware and in the clean room. So if you work in a clean room, you have to um, not wear any makeup or lipstick or lotion because all those things, if they if makeup flaked off on your face, that would be a source of contamination and oils from your fingers could smear and smudge things. So we try to take a lot of precautions to, to keep things clean to protect ourselves and to protect the hardware and the clean room and the clean areas that we work in. Is there any kind of unseen force that can interfere with the path of a satellite? So the path of a satellite is most going to be directly influenced by space junk that's floating around in space. That's debris from dead satellites and debris from chipped off paint or anything of that nature. And that's also tied into why it's important to make sure materials used are uh, strong because they may um, get impacted from space de debris as well. Thanks so much, Doris. And thank you for another round of great questions. Don't forget to tune back in next week to meet another one of our engineers. And until next time.